so with that, let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. We're looking at verses 8 through 16 today as we continue our series on the heroes of faith. This is Heroes of Faith Part 2, Abraham and Sarah. And so uh, Hebrews 11, 8, let's read the text We're just looking at 8 down through 16. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland and truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they'd come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared a city for them." If you're new to us, we're going through the book of Hebrews. It's our habit to start a book, go through it, and then teach the very next book. And if you've grown up in a system where everything was topical, you're going to find this is a really sane and, and profitable way to study the Bible because it's the way you study any other book. I can't imagine someone going to flight school and, and then, and then uh, you know, taking a test and, and the, the written test and they're like, well, I didn't really, you know, cover the whole thing. I just kind of looked at chapters I found some interest in and, and uh, I can guarantee you don't want to get in a plane with that guy. And, and so when you're studying the Bible, it's good to walk as we have from Genesis to Revelation, from Genesis to Revelation, from Genesis to Revelation. I think this is my fourth time. It may be more, New Testament more than that for sure. So Hebrews was written, a little background, to people who knew and treasured their history is God made and fulfilled promises. We're going to read and reflect on some of them today as we journey together through Hebrews 11. I did notice in my preparation that, well, once you get past uh, Abel, Enoch, and Noah, that's who we looked at last time. I'll touch on them for a moment. You get to Abe, and I was thinking, Abe, he, he, I call him Abe, but his real name is Abraham. And then I remembered, hey, we have a guy in our history named Abraham. His name was Abraham Lincoln, and he is responsible, I think 16th president, but emancipated the slaves in America and, well, got shot for doing it. But the bottom line is we can go back in our history and see how God used certain individuals to change the course of history. And that's what we get when we're reading a chapter like this, because it is citing all these people who God talked to or led and, and, well, they responded as God would have them respond. Last time we saw three priorities for every believer, walking our worship of the Lord, walking with the Lord, and then working for our Lord. We saw them in three people by faith, Abel worshiped, And we're told he offered a more excellent sacrifice than his brother because, well, he did so in obedience to the Lord and he did so by offering a blood sacrifice. What did he get for his obedience? Ultimately, he's murdered by his brother. And get this, it's the first family. There's only four people. And one of the brothers kills the other brother because he was jealous and because he wouldn't do what God wanted and his brother did, he decides to murder him. So he's the first murdered, he's the first martyred, 
And he is a hero of the faith. The first mention goes to him. Then we saw Enoch walked with and pleased the Lord, and the Lord took him home. He is the first raptured by our Lord, something I believe our generation will experience. He is the first to have never died. And so that's a big deal because anyone raptured will not go through death. Ordinarily, the only way to get to the Lord is through death. But that's not the only way to get through to him. So anyway, third is by faith. Noah worked, so Abel worshiped. Enoch walked, Noah worked. Having been warned of things not yet seen, he obeyed. He built an ark for the saving of his family and so much more. Today, we move on to Abraham and Sarah, to whom God made promises only he could fulfill. Abe's walk of faith began with God's commands to and covenant with him in Genesis 12. I'll read a bit of it. And uh, if you want, go back there. It's easy to find it. First book of the Old Testament. And, uh, but we're only going to read a few verses. But nevertheless, there's a lot that comes out of this particular part of Abram's story. Genesis 12, 1, the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And the Lord says to him, after calling him to separate himself from everyone and everything that was familiar to him, all his security, all of his history, all of his family, well, he goes on to make five promises to Abe. He says, I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So the five promises made to Abe, a land, a great nation, a great name, reciprocation, blessing those who bless and cursing those who curse, and then a Messiah, a Savior, not just the Savior of Abe and his family or the Savior of the Jews, but the only Savior for all men would come through this line and come through Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob. And then, well, in any case, we'll go through those guys as we move ahead. So a couple things. I couldn't help but make a connection. You know, we don't always connect the dots to everything, but God makes five promises here that only God can fulfill. And as we read through the story, at least in Hebrews, it sounds like God said, hey, here's what I'm going to do. And they're like, hey, we're down with that. Let's go. And, and, and so they, they just did everything God told them to do, trusted in him completely. But I want to say that's far from reality because Abraham was a regular guy. He wasn't a superhero or a super saint. He was just a guy raised by an idol worshiping father who God got a hold of and pulled him in and made promises to him and did miraculous things for him and then through him. But all of this to say, and it's so important that, that God's promises are always good. Everything God thinks about and, and has to say to Abe, to Isaac, to Jacob, to you, to me, it's because God is good and he's a blessing and gracious and merciful and kind God. There's another guy, not God, who wanted to be God. His name was Lucifer, and I'm sharing this with you only because it's five Five I wills. See, God tells Abraham, hey, I will, and I will, and I will, and I will, and I will. And then here, here's what Satan has to say. It, well, Isaiah 14, 12 actually speaks of him. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the earth, you who weaken the nations? For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. But God says to Satan, to Lucifer here, is what he's called here. 
He says, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. Satan's I wills were all about self-exaltation, saying, hey, I'm going to be like God, and I'm going to do this just like God, and I'm going to do this. The problem was God's not into self-exaltation. And God's five I wills to Abraham, they affect the whole world from that point on. And they're all about blessing people. When God makes promises, those promises are good. And, and, and when Satan says, hey, here's what I'm going to do, God says, well, we'll see. And then he just says, that isn't going to work out. By the way, when Eve was tempted by Satan, he promised her the very same thing. He had realized by this time, I'm sure, didn't work for him. He said, you could be like God. And, and, and here's the crazy thing, and I, I know some of you are aware of it. Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. They had perfect fellowship with God. They could never become more like God than they were at that point. But he's saying, you could be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, listen, all they knew was good, and he never wanted them to learn evil or experience evil, that's not him. So Satan's a liar and he's a duplicitous liar. That word means he, when he lies, he believes his own lies. It appears he still thinks somehow it's gonna work out for him. We know better because we have the rest of the story. Well, in any case, let's spend some time here walking through after those promises made to Abe, in Genesis 12, 1, 2, and 3, we're up to verse 8 in our study of Hebrews 11. And it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would after receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. I want to say, when you read this, and I read you the, the whole section on Abraham and Sarah, we'll come back to Abe and Isaac next time. That will be his firstborn. But, um, but it, anyway, well, that, that's the intention, the firstborn according to the will of God and the word of God and the promises of God, the child of faith. We'll see there's a little glitch in that whole thing. Uh, although when he... And we'll see it next week when he's told to go sacrifice Isaac after he's grown up. He's not nine years old. He's like 30 years old. He says, take your son, Isaac, whom you love, your only son. So this is a lesson for next time. I shouldn't even go there because it's like, but it might get you to read ahead and that wouldn't be bad for you. Anyway, here's one of the things I want to point out as we walk through this together, that if you just read it, it sounds like God said, hey, here's what I want from you, and they did it. Nothing could be further from the truth. He did leave where he was to head to where he was going, but he didn't leave all his family behind. He brought Lot with him, who turned out to be a lot of trouble to him and for him. But not just that. Abraham's faith often faltered, but God's faithfulness never does. When we're faithless, we're told, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. And that's just saying he can't change his nature. God's perfect and everything he does is right and just and pure and holy and perfect. So he gets the word from the Lord and it said he went out. And this is something many of us guys can relate to. It says not knowing where he was going. Uh, that's pretty common for us. Uh, you know, before they had the, the electronic lady that talks to you, I call her the Nagavator. Um, before we had her, I had Maps and Pam. And Pam had a super good sense of direction. So we could look at a map and then she could kind of map it out in her mind and just tell me everywhere to go. Then we got the Nagavator. And then Pam and the Nagavator would actually argue about where we go and what we do next. So that was a lot of fun. But, but the bottom line is, when I went out, 
I knew where I was trying to get to. I had no idea where I was going or how to do it. I use those maps regularly. I still use, uh, you know, the, the Nagavator regularly. Uh, and Pam's memory isn't as good. Not that that's a good thing, but she's arguing less with the Nagavator because she's, she's argued one and got us somewhere we never wanted to be. So all of that to say, he left not knowing where he was going and his obedience will bring him ultimately into the land of Canaan where the Lord will appear and speak to him again. Sometimes God tells us to do something and then we like have all this stuff going on in our lives and we're like, Lord, what's happening here? And how come this? And why didn't you do that? Or what's up with this? And God's just saying, hey, I told you what to do. And I told you where to go. Just do that and go there. And when you get there, we'll touch base again. And that is kind of how it happens for Abe. It, God will appear off and, off and on. He'll, he'll show up in chapter 15. He shows up in chapter 17. If you go through Genesis, well worth reading. If you're familiar with it, and then, well, you, you get a lot more out of this. If you're unfamiliar, familiarize yourself. If you're so familiar that you're like, hey, you're going to tell these stories. I've heard you teach these stories so many times. I don't know if I can take another one. Here's a tip. Teach Sunday school then. Because we need people that know these stories as well as I do. Because when you teach Sunday school, you need to know the stories. If you're just sitting there reading it like this, the kids will be pretty soon, they'll have you locked up or tied up or something. So anyway, all of that to say this. Abe does obey the Lord, but there are a few glitches along the way. And Sarah will obey the Lord, but she too has a couple issues that cause some real problems. Now, he says, once Abe makes it to the promised land, he says, to your descendants, I will give this land. And then we're told, and, and, and then he built an altar to the Lord. It's the first of six times Abe is going to build an altar. And an altar had one purpose, that was worship. It was built for worship, and that worship always required sacrifice, We'll get to see it in our next study as we look at Abe and Isaac together and what God required of him and then didn't require of him, but at least showed him and us how much a guy can grow who starts out, well, pretty good, and messes it up and then does better and messes it up and does better and messes it up, but ultimately ends up where God wants him. And then we get to see the growth that happens over the years of walking with the Lord in obedience to the Lord. So at this point, he's walking by faith. He's worshiping the Lord in the land of promise. And this leads to a test of his faith. And know this, the enemy tempts us and his goal is to get us to fall, to falter, to fail, to sin. But God never tempts us to sin, James says, nor can God be tempted to sin. He does test us though, but it's always a pass-fail test. He wants us to pass it. If we fail it the first time, he's like, well, you might want to do a little homework and then come back and we'll take it again. And so if you're going through a test, then you think, well, is this the enemy or is this the Lord? If it's the enemy, he's trying to get you to fall. If it's the Lord, he's trying to prove that you're growing, that you're maturing, that you're trusting. And you do that by obedience to him. So uh, there's a famine in the land. That's, you know, pretty common in scripture. It often leads people to make bad decisions. And in this case, um, a worse request as they go down to Egypt won't be there Last trip down there, but it's the very first trip down there. Motivated by, motivated by fear, imagining what could go wrong. Abe, well, he, he ends up asking his wife to, to lie and say that she's his sister. So um, here, here, here's what happens. Um, she's beautiful. She's godly. She's submissive, but Abe's fear lands her in Pharaoh's harem. Now, Pharaoh blessed Abe, and that's confusing because he's like, well, I put her in there, and look, he's giving me all this stuff. Worked out pretty good. And then God plagued Pharaoh because God wasn't going to have this. And then Pharaoh rebuked Abe, 
and Abe ultimately heads north. So um, maybe you've heard the saying, all's well that ends well. Maybe you've even said it or thought it. Well, listen, that's definitely not the case here. It might look like things worked out okay for Abe, but the father of the faith asking his wife to lie? Guys, that's something we should never do. That's something we would never do, right? I mean, you know, taxes come. You're not going to ask her, hey, we got to fudge this a little because... Never engage her in anything you shouldn't do in the first place. That's a good tip for all of you who are married or hope to be. So anyway, um, there's no way that this worked out and, and there was no problem. Abe and Sarah survived this trial because God was faithful. And you get to see in Sarah what it looks like when a wife is submitted and submissive to her husband. But get this. Her faith wasn't in her husband because he's already doing wrong, already asking her to lie. Her faith was in God, not Abe. That's why she is the first female listed as a hero of faith, and she will not be the last. The heroes of the faith, well, they're not all guys. Many women walked by faith in God and, and trusted in him, and that's what's happening here. She honors her husband by submitting to his request. But in the midst of that, she has to just trust that, okay, Lord, I don't know why he'd ask me to do that. I know this isn't right to do, but I'm trusting you to work this out. And God actually does. So in any case, um, you know, at this point, Sarah survives the trial. Abe survives the trial because God is always faithful. When we're faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot and will not deny himself, his nature, his character. It's always right and righteous and good and holy. So um, I do believe though, the stain of this sin and the stink of this sin would follow them. In Genesis 20, there's a deja vu. Abe fears for his life. Another city, another situation. The outcome is very similar. Sarah's at risk because, did I mention that she's beautiful? And when he says, hey, you're so beautiful, they're just going to take you and want you, and then they'll kill me. That's what he's thinking the first time. And now what happens, he's grown a little bit, but just a little bit. How do we know? Well, he doesn't ask his wife to lie. That's growth. But he still lies. Said, "Ah, oh, she's my sister. You know, that's, you know whatever. And, and so in any case, it's a deja vu and, and it's an ugly scene. Sarah's at risk again. God intervenes again. Abe is rebuked, rescued, and then rewarded again. And I'm like, oh, Lord, you let people bless him even when he's messing it up. And then I think, doesn't he do that for us? Isn't he like that with us? Do you think every time you're blessed, it's because you were the best you've ever been or did the best you've ever could? No, he blesses us because he's good, not because we're good. So Genesis 26, Abe has a son, Isaac. Well, he has the son prior to that, but he, the heir of all promises, the promises of God made to his father now will be fulfilled in him. And yet he commits the very same sin. So that's just kind of a preview of, of and, and a reminder for those of you who, you know, know. And, and for those who don't, when God has a hero and says, here's a guy you can emulate. Here's a guy you can follow after. He's not saying everything they did is something to emulate. Not everything they did is something to follow after. No, he's just saying, in the end, Abe gets it right. And God blesses him and, and God protects her and God protects him. And everything he promises to do, God will do. Well, anyway, uh, back here in Hebrews 11:9, it says, By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob. So that'll be his son and grandson. The heirs with him of the same promise. So in verse 8, he went out. In verse 9, he wanders, not aimless, 
aimlessly, but obediently. And, uh, and Abe, by the way, was one that built altars. That's a big thing because, again, well, altars have one purpose. We already saw it back in verse 8. Now it's, it's, we're going to see it again and again and again. But he builds altars because he's walking with the true and living God who deserves sacrifice and, and calls us to it. Well, anyway, what he didn't build was houses or palaces, or temples, or cities, or memorials to him or his family. He raised the family in the fear of God, telling them all God told him, and all God promised to him, and all God purposed for them, because God's promises are always generational. It's very rare. You might find an exception to that rule, but it, it's, it might be that God says, hey, I got this for you. I guess we have an example of that in Enoch. I don't think he, he was around that long. But the, the bottom line is he is an, an example to all of one who uh, walks by faith in the Lord. So um, anyway, then here's what comes up next. Verse 10 says, for he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. It says he waited for God to fulfill his promises. Well, most of them, but sadly not all of them. And it got me thinking because all of this starts when Abe's like 75 years old, his wife's 65 years old, and he's promising, you know, a name and a nation and, and a land and reciprocation and a Messiah through him and then through his descendants. And so the, the question is, okay, if he's promised all that, when is he going to make good on the promise? And, and uh, it's important to know that they wait for a while. And, uh, but they didn't wait long enough. How do we know? Well, what happens is, is well, we're going to see it in a minute. I'll just, I don't need to, to, you know, jump ahead to it. We'll see it as we read on. But let me give you a couple thoughts and then we'll do just that. Uh, I want to say that, that they waited for him to fulfill some of his promises, but they didn't wait. And if they didn't wait, uh, long enough, well, then that means they were taking things into their own hands. So I jotted to make sure I said it just like this to you. When God promises, promises to do something only he can do, well, how long do you think we should wait until he does it? It's a really simple question, but I want you to dwell on it. When God promises to do something only he can do, how long should we wait for him to do it? And I'm thinking there's only one answer to this, until he does it. Because anything we do to help him, that's going to prove to be a problem. And that's exactly what happens to them. The, the answer is, like, we wait until he does it. So if God's made promises to you and you're sure of them, you're certain. God said he's going to do this. I know it's him. I know that he's faithful. Well, it's important that that, well, you kind of wait and let him do his stuff. So as citizens of a heavenly kingdom and visible to us, um, we need to know that, that whatever God's promised is sure and secure. Now, 11.11 here makes it sound like um, God promised it, they hung out, and then God just did it. But uh, we read, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age. Now, if it happened in the first year, that would even make sense. I mean, he's 75, she's 65. How, how many of you had a child at 65 or older? Because I'm interested in this. And I've, I've been there for the birth of my sons, and I'm going to say at any age, you know, that's a pretty tall order. But, but the bottom line is these guys got to get with it because he's got to be like, hey, I'm 75, you're 65. God promised a kid. We're going to need to make that happen. And, uh, 
And the truth is, they would make it happen, but there was going to be a slight delay. It says that she judged him uh, and received strength because she judged him faithful who had promised it. It sounds like he promises, she believes it, and then she has the child. There is going to be a slight delay, though. You know, like when you're at the airport and they say, we have a slight delay. And the next thing you know, you're looking for a hotel because that slight delay is overnight. Well, anyway, from this man, it says verse 12, because he's given us the good news. Then we'll talk about the bad news. From this man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. Those promises from Genesis 13. So he has promises in 12, 13, 15, and 17 and elsewhere. So uh, the proofs here in Hebrews that God did make good on his promises. And again, he's 75, she's 65, but um, it sounds like he promised again, they believed and everyone lived happily ever after. So turns out though, um, though I'm sure they did their part, you know, without going into any detail because it's so not necessary. Um, she's 65, he's 75. I'm thinking they get, think, well, there's no time to waste. So they walk by faith. They did whatever they could do to help things along. They wait for a year and nothing. They wait for two years and nothing. They wait for five years and nothing. They wait for 10 years and nothing. Now, that doesn't mean the whole time was a bummer. I'm sure that, you know, at least Abe was real happy. But the, the bottom line is she at this point begins to doubt, not that God would provide because she knows God's going to provide a child, that he would be the child of promise. He would be born miraculously because, hey, they're getting up there, right? Ten years have already gone by. And here's what happens. She says to him, this is Genesis 16, 2, if you want to jot it down and take a look later, verify it, validate it. Be sure that that's really what's going on. Sarah says to Abram, now, see now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. Couple things. First of all, this would have been common in that day. And, uh, you know, remember, they come from a pagan culture. They're not the, the first to to you know, know that there was a real and a true and living God, but they are walking by faith with him and they're in the wilderness and they're headed to, well, the place where he would build and or ultimately God would build Jerusalem and, and, and the temple and all those things. But so all of that to say, they walk by faith, but Sarah begins to doubt and she has no doubts about God. She's just thinking, maybe he didn't mean me. And I want to say, guys, gals, dads, moms, future dads and moms, if God promises to do something, the last thing he needs is help from us. The other thing he doesn't need is us disqualifying ourselves to do it because we really are at that point where we're like, well, it's got to happen because God said it, but I don't really see how I could be a part of it. And that's what she's saying. Maybe he didn't mean me. Maybe we got this wrong. And so now here's, I'm thinking this should be a no brainer for the father of the faith. I mean, he should just say, no way, Sarah. That's, we're never going to do that. We'll just wait and we'll trust the Lord. And well, he's going to show himself strong on our behalf. But that's not what happens. It says Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. She's Sarai now. She'll be Sarah later. He's Abram. He'll be Abraham later. And so he heeded the voice of Sarah. And I just like, what? Wait a minute. No, there's no way that that's how this goes. What happened? I'd be like, Abe, wake up. Dude, you have these promises. So Sarai, Abram's wife, verse 3, took Hagar, her maid. And all this is out of Genesis 16, by the way. Took her maid and uh, gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. 
and, and by the way, her maid's name is Hagar. That's important. The Egyptian gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife after Abram had dwelt in the land of Canaan for 10 years. Now, Hagar conceives and bears a son named Ishmael. When, well, this is 11 years after God makes the promise, but God's still going to fulfill his promise. And that's important to us. We'll glean some stuff you, you want to make sure you hang on to related to that. So um, the problem with Ishmael is this. He is not the promised son. He is a work of the flesh. He's a child of unbelief. He's not the heir God promised. And he's not the, the, well, the promised heir. And so I jotted, so I wouldn't forget to say it. When God promises the impossible, don't help. Just wait. Wait and see how he's going to do it. Wait and see what he's going to do to make the impossible possible. Because what she did, and in thinking this, you know, this is, this is probably just not going to work out for me, is, is she denied the Lord's promise. But here's, here's the good news. Again, when we're faithless, he's faithful. 13 more years will pass. Abe will be 99. Sarah will be 89. And God will show up and repeat his promises. And that's when he changes Abe's name from Abram to Abraham. Abram means exalted father. Abraham, father of many nations. God reaffirms his covenant. He gives Abe a sign and seal of that covenant. Every covenant is, is established in blood, but the sign and seal of this covenant is circumcision. So everybody, everyone in Abe's camp, and it was a big camp. We touched on uh, Abe going after Lot and with he, when he and five other kings were taken captive and there was this whole mess and he brought them back and he had a standing army. He armed these people that were with him and, uh, and so he, he had a, you know, something really going in all that. But the bottom line is this promise is one that God made and one that only God can fulfill. So um, he says, you know, if this is Genesis 17, 15. If for those of you who jot notes or just want to check it out later or just read chapter 12 until the story ends and you'll, you know, get into 22 and you'll be just Abe and Isaac and that's where we'll be next week. So God says to Abraham after repeating the promise, uh, giving him a sign and seal of circumcision as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name and I will bless her and I will give you a son by her and I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations and kings of people shall come from her. Abe's response to all this, Abraham, verse 17 of Genesis 17, fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who's a hundred? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? The answer is yes and yes. That's exactly what's going to happen. We know the answer. God fulfills every promise. He just does it according to his own time and timetable. So um, Abe is told to name the son Isaac. Isaac means laughter. So this makes sense. It's like if, if, if his name means laughter and they're calling him for dinner, they're going to go, hey, <laughs> come to dinner. Uh, or they're just going to say, hey, laughter, funny boy, come to dinner. And, and here's the interesting thing that that when she gets word, because this is what his response is, unbelief, but still going to happen. And when she gets word, she laughs too. And I want to say having a child at 95, or excuse me, 90 years old, having a baby, well, that's no laughing matter. And I don't have to tell you that. Nobody said over 65, think about that. 90 years old, she's going to have a baby. Now, what matters to us today for each of us is to note these couple of things. First of all, nothing they did and nothing they tried to do 
and nothing they failed to do changed God's mind and plan. Nothing they did, him having a child by Hagar, the maid, God just said, hey, that doesn't change anything for me. It changed some stuff for Abram, though, because these boys were not going to get along, and, and this guy was going to be a thorn in Isaac's side once he was born, and their descendants would be at war, and they're still at war all the way today. So th this, is a, this is like a small thing that turns into a huge problem, generational problem. So Basically, though, let me say it again, because this is what we need to take home. Nothing they did, nothing they tried to do, nothing they failed to do could change God's mind and plan. But sin always has consequences. Nobody slides, nobody skates, nobody sins, and God's just like, well, no big deal. Sin is so bad that Jesus had to go to the cross to pay for your sin and my sin. And, and listen, we, we think in terms of really gross sin and then not so bad a sin, but the least sin you ever committed, the least sin I ever committed was enough that Jesus would have still had to gone to the cross for us. The wages of sin is death. That's what we had coming. The, the gift of God, everlasting life. That's what we're been we've inherited, or you can today if you've yet to, but that's in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Sin's consequences would be generational and continue all the way to now. So the descendants of these two boys would be bitter enemies as they are today. Now, verse 13 says this, these all died in faith. That means they were still trusting the Lord, believing the Lord, looking forward to him, fulfilling his promises, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. They were assured of them. They embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had been called to mind that country from which they'd come out, they would have had opportunity to return, but now they desire a better country, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And listen, it's doing the same for us. We who are in Christ Jesus are told that, that when Jesus was prepared to um, to leave and, and go back to the Father. He told his disciples, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. That promise isn't just to those first disciples. That promise is good for us. He's preparing a place where in the Father's house. And, and uh, you know, he, God did some pretty good stuff in a just seven days and and he, he's had a couple thousand years almost now to prepare whatever he's putting together for us up there I'm thinking it's going to be pretty good and uh, better than anything we can imagine or or even begin to uh, to embrace so um, God's not ashamed to be called their God he's prepared a city for them and listen that city for them just like for us it's wherever he is we will be with him We'll get to meet and hang out with a bunch of them, all who died in faith. We'll talk about that theme as we move forward. All of them are, are going to be with the Lord forever and ever and ever. We who are raptured, who never die, that last generation who are alive at the, the coming of the Lord for his church. We meet him in the air. The trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ rise first. We who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet him in the air will be reunited with those who've gone before us, who died in faith, with faith in him. And listen, it won't just be them. Abel will be there. Enoch will be there. Noah will be there. Abel will be there. Sarah will be there. Why? They all lived by and died in faith. Lord, how grateful I am for your word 
and for the radical changes you made in me and in Pam as, as Lord, you called us to yourself and, and, and well, seeing my firstborn, experiencing the birth of Nathan, it just rocked me, Lord, and, 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 and it's just, just unhinged me because I knew he would want to grow up and be like me. And Lord, I'll, I'll never forget the, the day I went out in the front yard and prayed, God, just make me normal. And though we know, Lord, that there's some things even you can't do, you, you instead uh, revealed yourself to me in such a powerful and undeniable way. You, you revealed your plan for me, and I yielded to you, Lord, and have walked with you ever since. And I pray today for all those who are going through it, Lord. They're in some trial or some struggle and, and the, the doubts have come. And Lord, the, the enemy loves to sow seeds of doubt in our minds. He loves to whisper in our ears and, and, and all of that stuff. Lord, what's true is, is you. You're, you're the true and living God. You're the way, the truth, and the life. Your word is true. The Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. You said no one would come to the Father but by you. So, Lord, we know we have our faith in the one who can deliver. And I pray wherever we are in our walk, whatever we're going through this day and this season, that these things we're learning, we'll really learn the lessons so we don't end up repeating them. So that we learn to walk by faith in obedience, to trust you to do what you've promised to do. And Lord, we want to unite in prayer for any and all who are here in our midst who've never said, Jesus, come into my life. I believe you are my only hope. I'm a sinner and I know it. I've seen and, and, and watched people be transformed by you. I want to experience that transformation as well. So if you're here and you've never said, Jesus, come into my life, be my Lord and Savior, forgive my every sin. I give my life to you because you gave your life for me. If you need to pray and, and do that today, because you know it's all true, but you haven't taken that step of faith, prayed that prayer of faith, received him as Lord and Savior, I'd ask you to raise your hand and to hold it high. You might be the only one, or there could be many of you today, this hour, this service. I was the only one, though, the day I gave my life to the Lord, the only one to raise my hand, the only one to stand up and go forward, the only one to be embraced and, and begin a walk with Jesus that I have zero regrets about. I could say the only regret I have since becoming a Christian is that I didn't do it sooner. So if you are thinking these things are true and thinking maybe you should respond to them and act upon them, absolutely true. Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. There's forgiveness and everlasting life in him. There's hope in Jesus. There's life in Jesus. Anyone this hour, anyone this service? I see that hand. Awesome, brother. Anybody else want to join this brother and, and say, me too. I see your hand as well. Wonderful. That's two now. Trifecta, somebody else want to join the party? Listen, no decision could be more important. So I have no problem waiting on someone else who's in the valley of decision and thinking, man, I got to do it. Oh, I can't do it. Or how will I be able to do it? Listen, give your life to him. He'll transform you. Awesome. I see your hand there as well. Wonderful, brother. That's three of you now. Anybody else? And we're going to pray. Anybody else? You who raised your hand and anyone else who wants to pray along, believers, feel free. And if you didn't raise your hand, but you need to give your life to the Lord, pray these words aloud after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me, for sending Jesus, your only begotten son, to die for my sins, to die in my place. He gave his life for me, so I give my life to you. He died for my sins, 
so I could live my life for you. So I yield completely, take control, transform me, make me the man you created me to be. Now save me so I can become that man. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's welcome these brothers into the family. Awesome. Listen, please come up. We want nothing from you, but we have more for you. And I have a little pocket Bible. You can have it with you at all times. And I want to encourage you to come and let us just welcome you to the family of God and to give you a Bible and then to pray for you and you know, up close and, and all that. So we're going to all stand and, and everybody, we're going to do one more song, then everybody's going to go that way. I'd encourage you to go against the flow. This will be your first opportunity of a lifetime of such opportunities. Make sure you find your way down to us uh, and we'll welcome you. God bless. And uh, Cody, 